Understanding, Using, and Fixing Binoculars, a Virtual Laboratory, Part 2. This is another JDW Talks. If you want to know a little bit more about me, I have a small pocket website there. This was recorded in July of 2020. My goals for this video series, this two-part, is to discuss features that impact successful field use of binoculars, to show you what to look for when evaluating binoculars and tests you can duplicate, and to suggest some simple fixes for broken poroprism units. And I advise people in, in the first part to find their binoculars, take them out, and we will look at my test binoculars and their binoculars together and uh, uh, learn something between us about this important instrument. Part one, and here is an outline of part one, basically looked at general features of binoculars and also looked at the optics and uh, some aspects of human binocular interaction. Part two, on the other hand, is gonna be looking at binoculars in the field and some of the problems you may find when you're using them. So we're gonna try and make you aware of them and some potential fixes for those problems. We'll end this part by talking about a number of different topics. As you can see, cleaning lenses, uh, reducing jitter, and binoculars and birding. Here is some general references uh, I've added to this list, my Ocular Binocular Workshop. Uh, that's available online. You can pick up a copy. I explain more about that in part one. However, this time I'm also showing you references of uh, books, some of them online, Kindle books, that will help you repair poroprism binoculars. And if you go that route, you should at least buy one of these. I have a list here of suggested test equipment. We're going to be doing some tests in this section. And just a note that all the pictures you're seeing were taken with my iPhone 5S. So this is more about working parts. Things should be um, working well for you to have a good field experience. So let's look at binoculars. Uh, we see uh, on the front lenses, those are the, um, uh, the oculars, that the distance between them is called the interocular distance. And a lot of binoculars have that scale that's between the two oculars, and that scale is the distance between those lenses in millimeters, in millimeters. The idea was that you can go to any binocular that has that scale, and if you knew the distance between the pupils of your eye, you could set the binoculars for that. I don't know how many people know the distance between the pupils of their eye, um, and so, you know, it's, it's just kind of a, an added uh, text on binoculars that really isn't used that much. But you can measure the distance uh, of the binocular, the interocular distance, and if it doesn't um, equal what you think it should, you can actually rotate that scale by releasing the uh, screw that holds it in, in place. So for my workshops, I had this little... Um, uh, checking device, but you can use a millimeter ruler as well uh, to check that distance. That's really a minor problem uh, if that has is not recording accurately the distance between the center of each of the oculars. Now, if the if you do decide to go this route in fixing binoculars, and I don't blame you. Uh, you should realize that if you have uh, a pair of binoculars, that it would cost probably $50 to $100 for a professional 
to uh, look at it and maybe align it uh, and co could cost a lot more. And most of the Poro Prism binoculars probably aren't worth that much money. You can go on an online auction site and see a number of these binoculars being sold for $20, 30 $40. Uh, and it would be cheaper just to buy one of these that looks like it's in good condition uh, than to send it to a professional or to try and fix it yourself. But I have a couple of warnings here. Obviously, you don't want to try and fix a pair in warranty. I would never fix an expensive pair. Let the professionals do that. You have an investment in this instrument. Don't mess it up. You should be willing to accept that you may mess it up if you start to do this. Um, you may end up with a good example of a bad example of what not to do. You may end up with two monoculars. You should use proper tools if you go this route. Don't blame me for any mayhem that ensures, as I suggested, get one of the binocular rare repair books. There might be others out there as well. And there's lots of YouTube videos that will show you step by step what to do. Now, one of the problems may be that the hinge that puts tension uh, on the binocular to keep that interocular distance set is too loose. And so every time you raise the binoculars to your eyes, you have to readjust that distance. It's a real pain after a while. And so you want to make sure that it's firm enough that it will retain the setting. In fact, some birders, when I tell them you can adjust the distance between the interoculars by just moving the hinge, uh, didn't know that to begin with. So to adjust the hinge, while looking through your instrument, put pressure on the two sides of your binocular, the bodies, and move them around that center uh, bridge or the hinge pin until the distance between your pupils of your eyes equals the distance between the oculars for good viewing. And you'll know that when you see a single field of view. It's only in cartoons involving binoculars do you see fields of view represented by two separate circles. That should not happen. So if the hinges are under minimal pressure, they won't keep that set distance and you'll be fighting the binoculars. And these can be fixed by tightening the bottom adjusting screw. I'll show you a picture of this. Hiding behind its decorated cap between the objective barrels. Now some of them may have a set screw in that larger adjusting screw, so check it, check it out because you have to loosen it before proceeding. And don't over tighten the adjusting screw. So here's a view in the bottom. I remove that, uh, that plate and you'll see that, uh, that pressure screw there. One of the problems is that that slot is too big for conventional uh, screwdrivers. And, and you can really, uh, it can't turn it very well. Uh, you're gonna have to face that problem. One thing you might find somewhere in your workshop is a piece of metal, uh, like this is a little thicker uh, a saw blade that will fit in that slot and that can turn it, that can turn it. So just be careful. Uh, this uh, uh, metal is not very, um, uh, very hard and it can easily be, uh, be ruined with the wrong type of screwdriver. Now, you want your binocular to focus well and to keep the focusing, keep the stability of the focus. And I want to tell you some things about focusing and adjustment and what may go wrong. So let's look at the types of focusing. Here we have two types of binoculars. The one in the left are Poro prism binoculars. There are two prisms in each side of the body. The one on the right is a roof prism binocular. And uh, the, the ocular and the bottom lens, the objective, are in the same line. While left, the Poro prism binoculars, the ocular and the objective are not in the same line. The one on the left is focused by 
changing that insta focus lever. The one on the right has a knob. And normally when you see a lever like the one on the left, the resolution of the system isn't that great. You can go from uh, uh, one range of the focusing to another very quickly uh, because fine movement of focus is not needed. It's the oculars that move up and down on the poro prisms that forms a weakness in the system. There are other types of focusing as well. There's an individual focusing. Binoculars often, uh, early ones, just had individual focusing where you adjusted each eyepiece independently. There's obviously less to go wrong here. Uh, you don't see too many of these for sale anymore. And the one on the right is a fixed focus. We will talk more about that uh, later. So there are potential problems with these oculars going up and down at the same level. Um, and sometimes they don't uh, are not on the same level. There's a lag between the two. And there's a number of reasons why you may see a lag. So the center focus eyepiece yoke has long been a weak point in construction. What you need to do is look sideways at your binocular if you have a center focus poro prism and move the eyepieces up and down, up and down. Does one side lag versus the other side? When you get to the bottom, uh, when they're closer to the body and you start moving up, does one move up quicker than the other? If it does, every time you try and focus with those binoculars, one side is going to be out of focus. You're going to be fighting the focus uh, along the way. In fact, for good binoculars, if you rock the yoke, in other words, put a, put a, um, a finger on each side on the eyepiece uh, cup and see if you can see sword back and forth, it should be pretty firm. If it's not firm and it goes back and forth, that's a problem and that can be potentially fixed. So there's a couple of reasons why there's so much play between the eyepieces. It's possible that the binoculars were dropped when the eyepieces were farther away from the body and that snapped the yoke. And it's hiding, that, bro that broken area is hiding under that interocular scale. And uh, if you open up the maximum inter interocular distance, you sometimes will see that break. It will expose uh, itself. This is very difficult to fix, but there is a, um, a discussion on an astronomy website that I'm showing you at the bottom of this slide that, that shows you how this person solved that break problem. Uh, but it is difficult, very difficult to fix. Another problem is that there's actually a loose screw under that eyepiece distance scale disc that puts pressure on the two sides. And if you pry open, pry out that, um, uh, that little disc, which often uh, has um, uh, the name of the uh, uh, company that makes the binoculars, uh, you can see that screw there and you can tighten it and then maybe try and glue back that piece that you have removed. But certainly you should not uh, tolerate um, uh, unequal movement of the right and left oculars because it's just going to give you problems and headaches during uh, your burning day. To avoid breaking that yoke, always focus down to the body, of, focus the oculars down to the body before storing binoculars to reduce the chance of breakage if the binoculars are dropped. Another problem could be that the oculars can come completely out of the body. And if it does, it's likely that your distance focusing was off or you've even lost the ability to focus. What may have happened is that a holding screw has come loose and is inside either that bridge cylinder 
uh, for non-rocking uh, lever uh, uh, binoculars, or it's actually inside that rocker uh, compartment uh, of that binocular. And you're going to have to remove the rocket type uh, covering to rescrew that into the shaft of the oculus, uh, or uh, open up the bottom screw and, and with a uh, very narrow uh, screwdriver, uh, try and screw it back into the uh, ocular shaft. And there should be YouTube videos that will tell you about that. Now, your eyes are different, and binoculars recognize that, and they want to adjust for the difference between your eyes. So if we look at our binocular here, our sample binocular, and you look at your binocular as well, remember, I'm, uh, I'm uh, trying to get you to look at your own binoculars. This is a virtual laboratory, and your binoculars are part of the laboratory. You'll see that on the right ocular of this binocular, there's a scale on that uh, eyepiece, and that eyepiece can rotate, it can move. Um, it shouldn't be that easy to move it, but it will move. The left eyepiece does not move. The right one has a dioptic scale. And what you're going to do is you're going to, that's an adjustment that's going to be made between your right and left eye. Now, there's a very short video here uh, that explains how to adjust your binoculars uh, using that diopter scale. And so instead of my telling you what to do, although I'm going to give you some additional hints, take a look at this uh, video. Uh, the person explains how to adjust your binoculars. And remember, you could always pause this, uh, this presentation and pick up that information. So I want to add uh, two, two points about adjusting the diopter adjustment. The first thing you're going to be doing is using the center focus uh, to move uh, the whole um, ocular uh, platform up and down. And so you're actually uh, focusing the left side, the fixed ocular side, on some distant object. Avoid slow, fine focusing of that center focus lever. Do quick movements because your eye has a great ability to accommodate to unsharp images. You may think you're seeing a sharp image, but in fact, it's out of focus and your eye is forcing uh, that to become sharp. So avoid slow, fine focusing. Use quick movements uh, to, uh, to get that focus point. Another thing is that a Navy document I read advised to start the adjustment process by extending the oculars away from the binocular and adjusting the focus by moving the eyepiece toward the body. So they want you to focus on one side of that uh, focus band. And if you go past that focus, go back again. And it presumably makes a big difference. The Navy should know they're looking with binoculars at enemy uh, planes coming, they want to know about it. And so they've done some research on how to adjust binoculars for individual differences between the eyes. Alignment could be a problem with any binocular uh, uh, unit that you have. So binoculars are actually two telescopes that are parallel with each other. Um, and you need to have them well adjusted in parallel. Otherwise, your eyes are going to trick you to try and see one image. Uh, they will look cockeyed, cross-eyed, one eye up, one eye down, and you may not be realizing this. It's going to lead to eye strain, headaches, or a feeling of discomfort if these two telescopes are not in alignment. And it's best if not only are they in optical alignment, but they're in mechanical alignment too. That's true collimation. But the hope is at least they're in optical alignment. It's the vertical alignment errors that are more noticeable 
You don't notice the horizontal because your eyes will force the images to come together. So there's a number of ways of finding if your binoculars are in alignment. And you should know these, especially if you're going to a store and looking at some binoculars to buy, you want to make sure that they're relatively in good alignment. And this particular author in 1995 suggests the following. First, you adjust the interocular distance and the diopter differences that we already have covered. Then you pick a target such as a sign about 150 to 300 feet away and focus on it through the binoculars on both sides. Put down your binoculars. Don't touch them. Don't touch the setting. Stop looking for about 30 seconds. Let your eyes just relax and don't touch the binocular settings. Then what the author recommends is put your hand uh, covering the left objective, the left front lens. Bring the binoculars up to your eyes. Remember, you're blocking the left side. Look at that sign again without refocusing. Then move your hand away from covering the left objective. He indicates that the, if the object is at first out of focus, because now your eyes are suddenly trying to focus on that, but then quickly reverts back to focus, that there are probably errors in collimation or actually alignment. It could even be problems in focus or even magnification differences between the two sides. And your eye-brain system is trying to solve and would lead to eye strain and headaches when using this binocular, trying to fuse them into a single image. And if you're testing this, skip this one. A way I've used is to pick an object some far distance away, such as a large tree on top of a hill or a chimney on a distant house. You focus on that object after you have adjusted your binocular, and then move the binoculars away from your eyes, trying to see the images, and, and if it's far enough away, try to see whether you can fuse each of those images. That's called the exit pupil. And if the two images have become one and are overlapping, if you can do that, the binocular is in alignment. If they're out of alignment, you, you, you can notice that. You could also relax with practice your eyes. So if the binocular is out of alignment, you will see a misaligned double image. Now, if it's nighttime or it's raining outside, and you don't have a distant tree, or a, um, or a chimney, there's actually a cute way of doing this by using a mirror in your house. Uh, you put the binoculars on a tripod with a platform and you can actually see if there's an alignment problem with a mirror, uh, providing that at least the minimum distance that your binocular will focus uh, is uh, taken care of. So I've given you that, um, that website where that paper is. If your binoculars are out of alignment, now that's no fun. You really need to get them into alignment because this pair is going to give you uh, headaches. If it's an expensive pair and you have an investment in it, let a professional do it because the uh, ways of getting it back into alignment uh, on YouTube, etc., uh, will get you approximately there. But professionals have much better equipment. As I, as I say, it might be cheaper to do it yourself or even buy a used pair than to let a professional do it for some of the low-end binoculars you may have. So let me tell you some ways of doing the alignment. Again, warning about fixing it yourself. If you look at a center focusing a poro prism binocular, and both of these have this insta-focus lever. They're both Bushnells. You see there's a difference in style. The European style on the left, the um, objective lens, the one in the front, uh, is in a barrel that's screwed into the body where the prisms are. The one on the right in my photograph, it's one piece. Uh, uh, the body is one piece, which also includes the objective lens. That's called an American style on the right 
and the European style on the left. Look closely at that barrel. Do you see a gap in one side against the body? If you do see a gap, it's possible that it's what's called cross-threaded. And that's really difficult. In other words, that it's not threaded nicely into where it should be, but it's skipped, it's off center. And you may have to put a lot of force to try and pop that back into where it should be. And it's probably gonna damage it. Um, and after you do that, remove some of the debris. You may even need that sort of uh, a wrench there, that's a, a rubber uh, strap wrench to remove that. So that's one possible problem. Take a look and make sure they're seated well. Another thing you could do, and it surprisingly fixes a number of uh, alignment problems, is to switch the objective barrels from the right to the left and the left to the right side and see if that makes a difference. Sometimes it does. And then you might see if over tightening has an impact on the system. So this is one of the ways you can at least try and start the alignment process. Before you do that, some more uh, uh, help here, that make sure there isn't a set screw from the binocular body against that barrel so you can't turn it. You have to release that in order to turn the barrel. And again, if either barrel is cross-threaded into that body, that prism housing, some force may be necessary to pop the ejective barrel back into its proper threads and probably will weaken that part of the instrument. And if you do switch barrels, place a mark using a soft pencil on the body barrel before you start. So if you need to go back to the original configuration, you can line up the marks. Important enough to repeat it in this slide. So let me show you another way not all binoculars have this. In fact, probably today just a, a small minority do of how to align um, your binocular. So take a look closely at the front lens of your binocular. Look at the uh, objective and you might see two rings as I'm gonna show you in the next couple of slides. The inner ring is used to rotate the uh, objective lens and that's how you align the binocular you change the center of the uh, objective in terms of the body of the binocular and you can turn it with a wooden dowel the outer ring locks in the lower rings setting you got to be careful to protect the glass surface with a cut out piece of cardboard uh, because if you're using a spanner wrench and it slips you can easily scratch the glass surface. So here is a um, uh, individual focus binocular, an older one, and the older ones often have this method of alignment. We're gonna look at the objective lens and we're gonna look at it more closely here. And you can see that there is an outer ring, that's the pressure ring, um, and uh, you uh, move it counterclockwise to reduce the pressure. And then underneath it, there's another ring with just a single notch that can rotate. And as it rotates, it changes the center of the objective. And there's the notch for it. And I'll take it apart. So there's the pressure ring, uh, there's the rotating ring and the rotating ring fits on top of the objective lens mount. And if you look closely at this rotating ring, you'll see that the, the uh, width of it changes as you go along the ring. So that's one way of uh, aligning binoculars, but you have to you know, look and see if your binocular uh, uses this system. Another way, and there's lots of YouTube videos that show this technique, is that uh, a number of these binoculars have a screw that's accessible from the outside, it's on the body, that puts lateral pressure against uh, the prism. There are two prisms on each side, 
and there are two screw holes that will do this. You can come back and take a look at this because sometimes where that screw is, is covered by a flap or a sealed hole or underneath a protective covering of the binocular. And you will need uh, jeweler's screwdrivers, really small ones, to turn that screw. Don't turn it too much and check the alignment after each adjustment. So here is the body. Uh, this is part of the binocular. Um, if you, you can see that I have removed the, the uh, covering to expose where that uh, screw is, where that uh, starts. And on the right, you see the prism. You can see where the screw is coming in from the outside and against the prism itself. This is an easy one to uh, find. Uh, the the uh, one toward the objective side uh, is a lot more difficult to not only find but to turn. Now I do have some other concerns and you should as well. I want to talk about them. One test that we can run on your binocular and you can comp compare it to my test ones here is the near focus of the instrument. How close can you see something that's still in focus. And one reference indicated that for birding, a near focus for about 15 feet is acceptable, and you know, as much as 20 to 25 feet. I don't think that is acceptable. I think it should be much shorter. Many birders also observe dragonfly, spe dragonfly species, butterfly species, and they want close focus. In addition, I have a colleague who does bird watching He's a marine biologist. He looks into tide pools. So standing up, he's looking straight down and he wants something that will focus five or six feet down with his binoculars so he can see the animals and plants inside that uh, tide pool. So what we can do is we can test for near focus. However, it depends on the age of a person and the eye condition of that person running the test. For instance, if you run the test with eyeglasses, uh, not astigmatism, but near and far sighted, and you repeat the test after removing the eyeglasses, if you were near sighted, the record, the record that you now have is that you, your binoculars are focusing closer to the object. And Far-sighted people, when you remove your glasses, the object now appears to be farther focused from the object. Now, binocular manufacturers will tell you the specifications for near focus, at least for most of them. It's usually for young people. Older people don't have as much adaption to their eyes for depth focusing. So let's do a test. You got a 25 foot Tape measure, we have an object here, a duck, it's about four inches wide. We're gonna stand 20, we're going to start moving away from this duck, uh, standing up, so there's a certain amount of error here, uh, using various binocul binoculars, and when they, the duck is in near focus, I'm going to put the binoculars on the ground. There's a big difference between binoculars. You see that there are in the center one, the Swarovski and the little compact uh, binoculars that we talked about in uh, the first part of this presentation have very near um, focus points. You know, on the right, you see that most of them are probably in the middle of this 25 foot um, um, tape measure. The one in the very end, uh, not before the patio screens, is our 20 by 50 binoculars that we looked at uh, very closely on part one. And then the very distant one, well, we'll get to that in a second. So the Swarovski is supposed to have a near focus of about four and a half feet. I can see my toenails probably uh, with using that, and I certainly could see a dragonfly. And surprisingly, this little compact uh, binocular, which also my marine biologist colleague uses, that type 
also has a very close focus. Here is our 20 by 50 binoculars, not a good burning binocular. You'd have to be 25 feet away. I mean, it's embarrassing uh, in a birding group that suddenly a bird pops up in a bush in front of you and one member starts to back up because they can't see the, the bird in their binoculars, then their focus is not sufficient. And then farther out is something called a permafocus binocular. This is also called, incorrectly, autofocus. There's nothing autofocusing about this. It's your eyes that are autofocusing. Um, it's a fixed focus, and the focus is toward the depth of, of field uh, toward infinity. It's kind of an interesting system. Uh, they're still being sold. Uh, uh, the ads look great. You know, uh, uh, there's not very any moving parts. You're not worried about uh, uh, focusing. Simply raise them to your eyes. Um, focus free, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, what's interesting is that where the column is uh, for specifications for close focus, there's an asterisk. And the asterisk says, focus-free models are designed for viewing distant subjects. The close focus limit is subjective and dependent on the user's eyesight. How could that be subjective? Well, here is, if you're interested in these binoculars, Here's an article, and I've given you the, uh, uh, you know, where it is, about these, quote, self-focusing binoculars. They're not self-focusing. They're fixed focus. And this is what he says. He says that fixed focus binoculars rely on the flexibility of your eyes to keep the image clear and in focus. This is not a problem for children and young adults. But as you get older, and I'm 78, the eye slowly loses its ability to focus, and so for many people over the age of about 40, these binoculars can produce a lot of eye strain. Now, they're supposed to be in focus from 40 feet out. Um, I took out that duck outside, and to me, it seemed that they were only in focus when I was about 160 feet away from that duck. So these are not going to be good burning binoculars unless you're on... Uh, uh, an ocean somewhere and you're looking at a bunch of rocks that are offshore. What you want to do when you're looking at binoculars is resolution is going to be more important than magnification. How well can you see something? How well the resolution is of your instrument to tell that two close points are indeed two points apart and not where one were a blurry point. And good binoculars tell that you got two points. Uh, binoculars that have a lot of uh, aberrations of lenses that degrade the resolution may not be able to see them. So there are a number of tests for this. The simplest test I found is in a US Navy manual that says that you can make a rough test of the image by doing the following. Find and measure the greatest distance at which you can read clearly a newspaper headline or any print of comparable size. You can actually use a dollar bill. I'll talk about a dollar bill in a second. Once you have that distance where you can see clearly and where you stop seeing clearly, multiply, the, multiply that distance by the magnification of your instrument and then put that uh, uh, object, that print, uh, up in front of you, walk that distance away and observe it through your optical equipment. And if it's just as sharp and readable as it was with your naked eyes, then you probably have a pretty good uh, pair of, of optics, of binoculars. If the image is fuzzy, then, uh, well, don't buy that if you're uh, testing it. And dollar bills have been used uh, extensively to to look at resolution of binoculars because there's a great amount of detail here, uh, shading, etc. You might want to look at a dollar bill close up and then look at it with your binoculars. Now I'm going to show you three more tests. I'm not going to go into great detail with them. 
They're in the workshop manual. Astronomers find a star at night, focus on it, and then we uh, go back a little bit on focus. You see a round uh, halo, and then if you move your uh, focus point or, or the, where it is, you can see whether there is a uh, aberration in your lenses. You can do this during the daytime by having an artificial star reflecting off of a chrome uh, ball bearing, for instance. It's a way of doing testing. There may be stress tests that you may want to do. Um, you use cross polarizing. Again, my work uh, book will show you this. And what I've done is I put a plastic lens between two cross polarizers and you can see that the it's under stress. You, know, you obviously in optics don't want any stress. If I were to put a pair of your eyeglasses here, you'd be shocked at all the stress points uh, on that. That's gonna reduce probably resolution as well. And then there are eye chart resolution testing devices. You go a certain distance away, you see which line you can read uh, and it's a test of the acuity of your optical equipment. Cleaning lenses, I wanted to include this because it's important. You should have a number of tools, uh, blowers for, for blowing off dust, uh, brushes, um, this new magic fiber that's really great. But this is a dangerous activity for your binoculars health. Um, older glasses may have coatings that are easily rubbed off you should have a number of tools, including maybe some opti some um, glass cleaning solutions, but specifically for optical glass, like ROR, ROR. And you should know that dust contains small amounts of abrasives. So rubbing dry tissue paper across a dry glass surface with dust on it is gonna leave scratches on the surface. Never use, in addition, silicon treated tissues or cloth on lenses as they are known to destroy the lens coating. So the first thing you do is you blow the dirt off your lens with a blower. You gently brush dirt off the lens, breathe on the lens to put some moisture on the lens and clean it with a microfiber cloth. And in really difficult conditions, maybe use an optical lens cleaning solution. Don't overclean lens surfaces. Don't just keep cleaning it every time you see a little uh, piece of dust on your surface. So let's talk about jitter and reducing it. Jitter is a term for small involuntary muscular movements of your fingers and hands. You may not be realizing you're doing this, but as you're holding your binocular, there's a certain amount of shake going on. The higher the magnification, the heavier the weight of the binocular, the more awkward it is, the more the jitter is magnified. And there's some ways of reducing this. One thing that the Europeans do, you don't see that too often in the US, is to make a thin stick, uh, which is basically a small monopod, and hold your binoculars on that. You can even make it from, from PVC uh, pipe. Uh, they're not commercially available because you have to design it for your own uh, binocular and it has to fit in to the pin area. So here's one I made from, uh, um, these were blank yardstick uh, wood. Uh, you can see that I uh, uh, made it into a thin stick with the Finnish name for it. Uh, it fits into the, uh, between the, the body uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the bridge uh, is, uh, fits on the notch and it will reduce jitter. Some binoculars have a way of attaching a tripod, uh, which will cut down quite a bit. This is kind of uh, unbalanced. Usually the tripod hole is in the front. And for those, you need an L bracket. You might reduce jitter when you're looking at an, uh, a bird and you're wearing a hat that has a brim, that grab hold of the brim 
At the same time, you're holding your binoculars to form a bridge of support. That might reduce the amount of jitter as well. And then finally, there are stabilizing binoculars that will compensate for jitter and shaking. A little expensive, but for some people, uh, it is really a, uh, uh, a great invention uh, that they camp, uh, that they have uh, increased shaking, and that is going to uh, reduce the, um, their image, the quality of the image they see. And then finally, um, if you get a pair of binoculars and you may, like me, don't like that strap hanging around your neck, you can get something called a halter. You put your arms through the opening. Um, the connections are on your back. You have nothing around your neck, and yet they're freely available for you to, to uh, uh, move up in front of your eyes. So there's still a lot of binocular technology that one can talk about. And so with all of this, you need to find the bird in your binoculars. So practice, 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 looking at objects, looking at a plane going by, and looking and bringing your binoculars up to your eyes while still looking. That's what birders do. And the object should be in the center of the field of view. Birders, experienced birders, don't try and look for the bird within their binoculars. They look for the bird with their eyes and bring the binoculars up in front of their eyes, unless you're somehow scanning an area just to see what you can see. So in conclusion with this series, I wanted to do a video on a virtual binocular uh, laboratory, and this is my work product, and tell you that every birder should have excellent optics where mechanically and optically everything works together, and they should know what parameters there are uh, that will, that should work together. They should know some of the optics and uh, uh, how to adjust focus, etc. Today, there are a number of choices of very usable, usually roof prism binoculars in the 200 to 300 price range that would satisfy most people. So do your market research, read what others are saying about available models, certainly enough of that on the internet and even on YouTube. Decide on what features you want. So for instance, for eyeglass uh, viewers, you want a good eye relief. We talked about that in the first uh, video. Determine your budget and go for broke, double it. Because this is an investment, you're not gonna do this every year. And if possible, always test the, the units before purchasing. And then go out into the field and develop and enjoy your birding skills. So I hope that you've gotten a lot out of this virtual laboratory and uh, now understand some of the parameters of what you need to look at. So this has been a PowerPoint talk on my YouTube channel, JDW Talks. Once these two are up, I will have two virtual birding field trips to life of the naturalist Adolphus heron, in which a number of species, plants, fossils, uh, um, reptiles, uh, a bird, a heron's gull, etc., are honor his, his uh, memory, and four optic talks. I have a lot of genealogy talks, and well known in the genealogy world for my work on the census uh, research and finding people. And I, will, I have right now three Ellis Island talks about immigration procedures and finding people, and I will have two more uh, by mid-August. So if you want to find when those Ellis Island talks uh, are put online, you can subscribe to my channel. But in the meantime, if you think these are, are of value, uh, please post them on various burning and natural history websites to indicate that they are available. And with that, have fun, enjoy yourself in the field.